So, the next thing that uh, I want to discuss is uh, um, short keys theorem, okay, which is uh, now very easy to prove. Okay. So, uh, so, let me write it down, uh, uh, short keys theorem. So, this is um, let uh, alpha be a positive constant and beta be a fraction uh, and a, 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 a positive real number between 0 and 1. Okay. Uh, then there is a constant C alpha beta such that if script f is a family of uh, analytic functions. On the open unit disk, that omits the values zero and one and satisfies. f of 0 is bounded above by alpha for all functions small f in the family f, then uh, then mod f z is less than c alpha beta for all z with mod z less than beta. Okay. This is short case theorem <coughs> and the point is that this constant uh, c alpha beta, it depends only on alpha and beta and uh, it does not have anything to do with what the family is, it works for any family. And uh, the see such theorems when they were first proved they were uh, they were pretty uh, uh, they were considered pretty difficult but then uh, because of uh, because we have uh, montel's uh, <coughs> you know theorem on uh, normality and montel's test for normality it's easy to reduce this theorem okay so uh, so let me let me tell you the proof see so you, you can see immediately that uh, the, the uh, you you, uh, you want the family to be arbitrary therefore you consider the biggest possible family namely you take all analytic functions on the unit disk okay satisfying the condition that the uh, you know uh, value at zero is bounded by alpha okay so you you apply it to the largest possible family that you can think of okay and um, and you know See the moment you are given that uh, the these the these uh, functions omit the values zero and one, okay, uh, it means that the family is normal. See, in fact, you see what is um, what is no Montel's theorem on normality, otherwise called the fundamental normality test. See, if you want to decide a family of meromorphic functions on a domain is normal, then you need to know that it omits three values but three values in the extended complex plane. So, one of them could be infinity, right. But then if you are working with only with analytic functions, you already know infinity is not going to be taken. Okay. So, you have to only ensure that uh, the, for a family to be normal, to be able to apply the normality test, you have to only ensure that the uh, family does not, uh, every function in the family does not take two values. So, here it is given that the all these functions they do not take the values 0 and 1. So, you know if you apply the fundam uh, fundamental normality test that is Montel's theorem, it will follow that uh, if you take the if you take the family of all uh, analytic functions, 
if you take the family of all analytic functions on the unit disk which omit the values 0 and 1 that will be normal ok. So, this is Montel's theorem on normality right, but then we also saw another theorem of Montel ok which was a translation or an uh, improvement of the Arzela Ascoli theorem which said that for a family of analytic functions to be normal on a domain you need that the family is normally uniformly bounded that is it is uniformly bounded on compact subsets. So, you, if you see mod z less than uh, so you know uh, uh, so let me write uh, uh, let me consider mod z less than or equal to beta ok. If you look at mod z less than or equal to beta so I will change this here to mod z less than or equal to beta uh, which is what I meant to write but I did not. But if you take mod z less than or equal to beta that is a compact subset of the unit disk ok because it is close and bounded and therefore by the other Montel theorem which is a improved version of uh, the Arzela Ascoli theorem the normality of the family will tell you that the family is going to be uh, normal it is going to be normally uniformly bounded. So, it is uniformly bounded on uh, any compact subset. So, on this compact subset it has to all the functions should have a bound and call that bound as c alpha beta it is as simple as that ok. So, what you must remember is that we have applied two Montel theorems one Montel theorem which is uh, which character which which equates the normality of a family that is a normal sequential compactness of a family with the uh, uniform boundedness of the derivative uh, uniform boundedness of the original functions in the family on compact subsets normal uniform boundedness and that is mind you uh, that is a improved version of the Arzela Ascoli theorem you, and in fact uh, it used the Arzela Ascoli theorem plus a diagonalization argument right. And then we apply the more serious uh, uh, Montel's theorem on normality the fundamental normality test or fundamental criterion for normality which is a very deep theorem mind you that was the key to prove proving Picard's theorem ok that uh, the movement of family of uh, meromorphic functions omits 3 values it is normal the movement of family of uh, analytic functions omits 2 values it is normal ok. So, you apply those 2 theorems then Schottky's theorem is uh, simple corollary alright. So, uh, it happens that uh, there is a there is a paper of Salkman uh, in the uh, bulletin of the American Mathematical Society where several uh, where, he, where uh, he explains how uh, several uh, uh, problems in function theory uh, have easy uh, easy solutions by use of the Zalkman lemma. So, in fact there is uh, there is what is called the uh, 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 there is a very deep theorem called Bloch's theorem ok and it involves uh, 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 roughly it is uh, trying to estimate the size of uh, the largest size of a disk uh, uh, under the image of a u univalent or one to one analytic function. You take a one to one analytic function ok and then uh, you know uh, uh, you try to estimate uh, you you take you take the image and then you try to see what is the largest disk uh, uh, radius of the largest disk that is contained in the image ok. So, there are theorems of this type and there is a particular theorem called Bloch's theorem which is very very deep ok and this can be proved by using uh, this the so called uh, uh, Bloch Zalkman uh, principle which is also called as Bloch's principle ok. And uh, the whole point is Zalkman's lemma is very powerful, it, it gives you uh, uh, proofs of uh, 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 easy proofs of very deep results right. So, it is not it is not a surprise that you get short keys theorem ok uh, as a simple corollary. So, uh, so let me write down uh, uh, proof is uh, uh, uses uh, so let us uh, so uh, consider the family of all analytic functions on uh, the 
open unit disk. Uh, that will meet 0 and 1, this is normal. Uh, this is normal by uh, Montel's theorem on normality, otherwise called the fundamental normality test. Or sometimes it is also called fundamental normality criterion. Uh, again by another theorem of Montel uh, uh, along the lines of Arsila Ascoli uh, the family is normally uniformly bounded hence bounded hence bounded uniformly by c alpha beta on mod z less than or equal to beta See the point is I did not even use the fact that the functions uh, at the origin are bounded by alpha. Okay. I, I just I know that there is a there is a uniform bound all right and uh, uh, I simply call that uniform bound uh, C alpha beta actually I, I need not put that alpha there, but I can call it C alpha beta. The point is that I am I have to put in beta because I am looking at the bound on mod z less than or equal to beta which is a sub disk of the unit disk, close sub, sub disk of the open unit disk. Okay. Fine. So, uh, what you must understand that uh, is that this easy proof is because you have uh, the strong Montel theorem on normality which is a fundamental normality test. Okay. So, um, uh, see the, oh, all right. So, the so this is one thing. Then I would like to um, uh, I would like to discuss uh, the uh, I would like to discuss the solution to uh, the first assignment that I gave. Okay, so here is a problem that I gave earlier. Uh, let D be a domain in the complex plane, and f from D to C be continuous. such that for some in positive integer n uh, integer uh, f power n is analytic. Okay. Uh, then f is analytic. Of course, you know uh, I, 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 I need to take n greater than 1 because otherwise it is trivial okay. because if I put n equal to 1 f power 1 is just f power n is just f power 1 which is f okay. and uh, what is the what is the solution to this. Uh, well, so, uh, so the first thing is that uh, 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 so f power n first of all f power n means f of z whole power n which means f of z into f of z multiplied n times. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that we will use the fact that uh, the, uh, the zeros of an analytic function are isolated. So, since f power n is analytic okay, the zeros of f power n are isolated 
but then the zeros of f power n are the same as the zeros of f therefore the zeros of f power n are isolated okay and therefore what we will do is we will first throw away the zeros and look at the complement of zeros in the domain which is another, which is a subdomain okay all right and what we will do is that on that subdomain we will first prove that f is uh, analytical all right and then uh, we will have to worry only about these points uh, where f becomes 0 all right but then uh, we can apply Riemann's removal singularity theorem because each of these points will be isolated points in a neighborhood of which f is continuous therefore they will be, be analytic even at those points and that is the proof okay so uh, so let me write this down uh, um, uh, since the zeros of an analytic function are isolated the zeros uh, ez of f power n uh, the the set of zeros is isolated but the set of zeros of f power n is the same as the set of zeros of f so uh, the set of zeros of f in d is isolated uh, of course you know uh, uh, when you want to say the zeros of an analytic function are isolated you must make sure that the analytic function is not identically uh, uh, you know constant so this is the only case where this will fail is when the analytic function is identically zero if the analytic function is identically zero then this zero set is the whole domain all right that is the only extreme case but of course if f power n is identically if f is zero then f power n is identically zero and if f power n is identically zero f is zero so we let us assume that uh, f power n is not zero assume that f is not zero okay so uh, we we there is there is nothing to prove if uh, f or f power n is identically zero okay so uh, so I, that has to be uh, we we assume that f is not identically zero on d right so that is the only uh, thing that we will have to worry about uh, when you when you want to whenever you whenever you want to apply this uh, result that the zeros of an analytic function are isolated you better make sure that the function is not identically zero okay and usually we are not interested in that function right fine so um, so now what you do is uh, in any case uh, you you look at uh, uh, consider uh, d minus zf okay throw away the zeros of f okay uh, it's an isolated set of points so you you get a domain again so d minus zf is also a domain right and uh, it will still be open okay it will still be an open set and because you are throwing away some isolated subset <coughs> and uh, it will also be uh, uh, it cannot get disconnected okay so uh, because you are just throwing isolated points away it's not it cannot get disconnected so d minus z f is also uh, uh, it's also a domain okay and now we are going to look at this domain the uh, the advantage with this domain is that uh, f power n doesn't vanish f doesn't vanish because uh, the zeros have been thrown away so f power n doesn't vanish and f power n is an analytic function okay so you have a non vanishing analytic function on a domain now you know if you take any point in the domain if you take a sub then there is a sufficiently small disk around that point which is in that domain okay and the point is that if you have a non vanishing analytic function on a simply connected uh, region uh, on a simply connected domain then you can find uh, a, a, an analytic branch of the logarithm of that function and in particular you can find uh, nth roots of that function for any n the point is you can find nth roots which are analytic that is the whole point so if you want to find an, an nth root of a function which is analytic okay then the function should not vanish 
and the, the region and the, the, the set on which you want to find it must be simply connected all right. So, I, the, so the point is that uh, if you take f power n which is analytic and f power n does not vanish on d minus zf. So, if you take any point in d minus zf and you take a small disk surrounding that point in that small disk I can find an nth root of f power n and what do you expect it to be it has to be f ok. But this nth root is supposed to be analytic therefore, it will prove that f is analytic ok. So, uh, but a little bit of uh, a little bit more has to be written down ok. So, let us do that uh, uh, f power n is analytic and non zero on d minus z f uh, for z not in d minus z f uh, there exists a small disk small open disk mod z minus z not lesser than epsilon in d minus z f. Uh, since this is simply connected and f power n does not vanish there exists an analytic branch of log f power n in mod z minus z not less than epsilon ok. Consider consider the analytic function uh, so let me call this analytic branches g ok. Consider the analytic function e power 1 by n g which is actually see it is e power 1 by n g is actually a log of f power n ok and uh, you know this must be f all right you should expect this to be equal to f all right. Now you see uh, we will use the we will use the following uh, uh, how will you show that this is the, uh, the, the claim is that e power 1 by n g is a actually equal to f. Okay, the claim is e power 1 by n g is actually equal to f. Once you fix once that is proved it means f is analytic because e power 1 by n g is already analytic and that and e power 1 by n g is analytic because g is analytic and why is g analytic because g is an analytic branch of the uh, of the logarithm ok. So, I just have to we just have to prove that e power 1 by n g is equal to f in the small disk ok. <coughs> and uh, this will show f is analytic in a small disk, but then the point z naught was arbitrary. So, it will show that f is analytic on d minus z f ok and then to at, at points of z f you can apply Riemann's removal singularity and conclude that f is analytic on the whole of t alright. So, uh, so the only issue is now that I will have to show that e power 1 by n g is f ok. Now, what is common to e power 1 by n g and f? they are both uh, nth roots of f power n f is an nth root of f power n by definition all right and e power n 1 by n g is also an nth root of uh, f power n uh, because uh, if i take e power 1 by n g and raise it to the power n i'll get f power n okay i'll get e power g if i take e power 1 by n g and raise it to the power of n I will get e power g, but g is log f power n. So, I will get e power log f power n which is just f power n ok. So, both e power 1 by n g and f are nth roots of f power n alright and the point is uh, uh, you see uh, you take uh, uh, if, if, if you see the uh, so now we have to use the following property. If you take the uh, take any two uh, uh, logarithms of a complex number ok 
the they will differ by a constant uh, they will differ by a constant multiple of 2 uh, co constant multiple of 2 pi i you see if you if you take if you calculate the logarithm of a complex number of course it's only defined for a complex number which is different from zero there is no logarithm for zero okay so if you take a non zero complex number and calculate its logarithm then you know different logarithms uh, you you can you you know logarithm is a multi valued function okay and the point is that uh, the 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 real part is the uh, uh, the real logarithm of the modulus of the number which is non zero since the number is non zero and the imaginary part is the argument of that uh, uh, of that number of that complex number and the argument can be uh, the argument is defined up to a multiple of 2 n pi uh, uh, up to a multiple of 2 n pi therefore the imaginary part of, of the logarithm can be changed by uh, 2 n pi i I mean by 2 n pi okay so any two log logarithms of a number will differ by 2 n pi i we have to use that for each uh, z in uh, mod z minus z naught lesser than epsilon we have to do a little bit of uh, thinking uh, see you look at the function f of z times e power minus 1 by n g of z you look at this function okay see look at this function uh, this function uh, if I raise this to the power of n I will get 1 because you see if I raise this power n uh, f of z will give me f of z power n and e power minus 1 g z if I, if I raise it to the power of n I will get e power minus g z okay but e power minus g z is 1 by f power n because g z is a log of f power n all right. So this is equal to 1 so this means that you know uh, f of z into e power minus 1 by n g of z is an n it is an nth root of unity of unity okay and this nth root of unity but the point is it is an nth root of unity uh, uh, and this nth root of unity in principle could change if you change this z. So I will call it as omega z because it depends on z seemingly okay for every z if you take f of z times e power minus 1 by n g of z its power n is equal to 1 so it is an nth root of unity so for every point z you are getting an nth root of unity call that function as w of z so w of z is is that is that function okay but you see uh, what is this uh, so this so i'm just calling this function as w of z so what is w of z w of z is just f of z times e power minus 1 by n g z okay but notice here is where I will use the fact that f is continuous see I have been given that f is continuous I have to I have, so so f is continuous and e power minus 1 by n g z is also continuous so it is so the product is continuous so w becomes a continuous function w or omega of z is a continuous function so it is a continuous function from a disc and what is the image set it is the nth roots of unity that is a discrete set okay therefore the image has to be constant okay the image of uh, the image of a uh, uh, disk has to be uh, connected under a continuous function so you must get a connected subset of the set of nth roots of unity it has to be only it can be only a constant okay it can be a, only a single term so that means that this omega of z is a constant it's it's one you get the same nth root of unity for all z okay you get the same nth root of unity for all z so uh, so that is where you are using the continuity of f okay uh, since f is continuous uh, w is continuous on uh, mod z minus z not lesser than epsilon which is connected so w of z is equal to a constant uh, nth root of unity ok 
ok. So, what you get is you get f of z is e, uh, times e power minus 1 by n g of z is equal to constant. So, which means tell you which tells you that f of z is equal to the constant times e power 1 by n g of z. But of course, the right side is analytic. So, f is analytic. So, which is analytic on mod z minus z naught lesser than epsilon ok. So, uh, so the moral of the story is that since uh, z naught was arbitrary you get that f is analytic on d minus z f ok. On d minus z of f. Now, I will have to only worry at points of z of f points at which uh, f becomes 0. You take a point where f is 0 that is of course, an isolated point we have already seen that. So, it is an isolated singularity for f all right, but f is continuous there therefore, by Riemann's removable singularity f is analytic at the at, at those points as well therefore, f is analytic on all of t ok. So, it is an application of uh, Riemann's removable singularity theorem at each point of zf we have an isolated singularity of f, but f is continuous there so by Riemann's removal singularity is theorem f is analytic thus f is analytic in t ok. So, uh, so that is the proof that f is analytic ok. So, you you, you should see that uh, the point is that you are bringing in uh, you are using isolatedness of zeros of an analytic function ok. You are using the existence of an analytic branch of logarithm you are you are using Riemann's removable singularity theorem. You have a question? No, it is uh, what we have proved is around that point f is analytic you have proved. So, it becomes uh, if, if around a point a function is analytic that point is automatically by definition it is a it is a singularity it is an isolated singularity and Riemann's removable singularity theorem uh, applies ok. What is a singular point uh, of a function? It is a point uh, which can be approached by points of the where the function is analytic and what is an isolated singularity? It is a point where uh, in a deleted neighborhood the function is analytic. So, if you take any point of z f it is an isolated point and you can find a deleted neighborhood of that point where the function is analytic because I have already we have already shown that the function is analytic outside uh, the zeros of f. So, that point becomes an isolated singularity and then the question is what kind of isolated singularity is it and you know Riemann's removable singularity theorem says that if the function is has a limit at that point or is continuous at that point or is bounded in a deleted neighborhood of that point all these things are equivalent to the function being analytic at that point you can extend the function uh, to that point uh, you can define the re redefine the function value at that point if it is not already defined uh, and make it analytic. But in, in, in our case the function value at the, uh, at the, at the points of z f is 0 by uh, by our own definition ok and the function the point is again it is given you are again using importantly the hypothesis that the function is continuous even at points of z f that is the importantly used you are, you are given the function is continuous everywhere. So, in particular the function is continuous at each point uh, uh, of z f and you now apply Riemann's removable singularity theorem ok that is one thing and then uh, uh, of course, I also wanted to uh, discuss this uh, this problem uh, namely that the only uh, one one uh, 
uh, onto maps uh, uh, from the complex plane to the complex plane are of the form z going to a z plus b where a is not 0 ok. So, <coughs> these are the only automorphisms of the uh, of the complex plane ok. So, uh, let, let me do that also because it is an application of uh, the idea of singularities. Uh, so, here is another problem uh, the only uh, 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 bijective oops the only bijective holomorphic maps f from c to c are those of the form f of z is equal to a z plus b where a and b are complex numbers and a is not 0 and what is the solution to this? Well, uh, uh, the point is that uh, if f from t c to c uh, is, is bijective then uh, f inverse from c to c uh, is defined and bijective. And uh, uh, mind you that <coughs> uh, uh, see f is uh, uh, f, uh, f f is analytic, and uh, there is the inverse function theorem which will tell you that f inverse will also be analytic because f inverse will be locally analytic. Okay, so uh, uh, by the inverse by the by the inverse function theorem. f inverse is analytic ok. And now uh, we use the following thing uh, you know uh, uh, you treat infinite. So, the whole point is to treat infinity as an isolated singularity of f ok. You treat infinity as an isolated singularity uh, of, of, uh, of f inverse ok. So, f you, you look at f inverse ok and look at infinity alright. Infinity is an isolated singularity <coughs> ok and uh, or you can also take f it really does not matter. Now, uh, what kind of singularity is isolated singularity is infinity it can be either uh, uh, removable or it can be uh, pole or it can be essential ok. If it is removable uh, since f is entire uh, it will by Liouville's theorem f will become a constant ok. So, uh, certainly f is not a constant function because it is bijective ok it, it is surjective. So, uh, f, so, infinity is not a removable singularity the other possibility is infinity is a pole if infinity is a pole then f has to be a polynomial ok. But if it has to be bijective in particular if it has to be injective it should be a polynomial of degree 1. So, it is it has to be of the form a z plus b alright and the only other possibility is that f is uh, the infinity is an is, is an is an isolated essential singularity. But if infinity is an isolated essential singularity then in every neighborhood of infinity f will take every complex value except one several times in fact infinitely many times and that will contradict the injectivity of f. So, it cannot be an essential singularity. So, here you are you are using Picard's theorem alright. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, the moral of the story is that because of Picard's theorem you are forced to conclude that f is of the form uh, uh, f of z is of the form a z plus p alright and a cannot be 0. So, this is an application of Picard's theorem and that is why I wanted to mention it uh, by uh, look at z equal to infinity as an isolated uh, singularity of f or f inverse uh, uh, it it cannot be removable by Liouville 
it can't be essential by Picard. So, it has to be a pole hence a polynomial this must be of degree 1 by, in, by injectivity and, and that finishes proof. So I'll stop here.